Thank God for his word. I've been feasting all week off what God spoke through uh, Elder Waldron and Elder Franco this past Sunday morning. Amen. About the fight for our faith and how to keep it. Amen. Has that been a blessing to anybody else? Amen. That's really what he's after. And uh, I think it was Sister Jalicia that sent me an email later on this week concerning um, the shield of faith. King James says, according to Ephesians 6, King James says, and above all, taking the shield of faith. And how that once faith is attacked, if we lose faith, we lose everything else. You'll, you'll lose your righteousness if you lose your faith. Because what's the point? of disciplining yourself to live a righteous and a holy life if you don't truly believe in what is calling you to holiness and righteousness. So you lose righteousness. Ultimately, you, you lose the, the helmet of salvation. We'll lose salvation because we do not have faith. Um, we'll lose truth because we do not have faith. We'll lose peace because we do not have faith. And I'm sure any of us could testify, I can testify to this, once your faith starts getting attacked, all these other things are like dominoes. It's, you start losing your motivation to live holy and righteous. You start losing the ability to calm your mind and have peace once your faith is attacked. So I thank God, and I want to bring it up again uh, concerning what God spoke through the elders last Sunday morning, how important faith is. And then... So, so this week I've continued, and a lot of what we said Wednesday night has been on my mind too, particularly between the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I've been in Hebrews a lot uh, lately. And most of the time, when anybody goes to Hebrews, the great majority of the time it's to reference chapter 11. And anybody know what chapter 11 is, right? The Faith Hall of Fame is what we, we refer to. Yeah, the Faith Chapter, um, where it describes those who went on before us in faith and how that they died in faith, some, some of them having not received the promises, yet they died in faith and giving us an example that we would continue to fight and press for our faith, right? So I'm not going to belabor the point with Hebrews 11. If you haven't read it in a while, go back and read Hebrews 11. It's, it's very faith-inspiring to see what some people went through and then to compare myself with what I'm going through currently doesn't even begin to compare with what some of those people that are listed in Hebrews 11 had to deal with in their contention for the faith, which is where, exactly where Hebrews 12 starts out. Therefore, so he's talking about Hebrews chapter 11 and all that those, those people went through to fight the good fight of faith. Therefore, since we have received, so, or, or since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also, that's the whole point of Hebrews 11, is to inspire my faith. Somebody say my faith. Coming from a ministry standpoint, and, and, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this to at least some degree. We spend so much time trying to inspire other people's faith that a lot of times we don't spend time increasing our own faith. Has anybody ever experienced that? Like, and, and to some of you it may relate to encouragement. I, I, uh, as elders, we have to do a, a lot more than encourage. We have to reprove. We have to rebuke. And, and, and sometimes people do their job and then they quit working on themselves. But for the sake of practicality, encouragement, you do so much to encourage somebody else's faith, but you at the same time are struggling in your own faith. Right? To me, that's... I, I, I guess a lot of people can see that as being hypocritical. To me, that's not being hypocritical. Being a hypocrite is you know you don't believe what you're saying. Right? I don't believe God's going to deliver you, but I'm telling you God's going to deliver you. I'm a false prophet. Right? But for somebody who's struggling in their faith, and though I am at the same time struggling in my faith, if I'm trying to increase your faith, that's not hypocritical in the least. Y'all looking at me like, I don't know if 
about that. There ain't one of us in here that at some point doesn't fight their faith, fight for their faith. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how many spiritual experiences you've had. I don't care how much scripture you know, how much Bible college you've been to. Your, your faith still gets attacked. Right? That's what I'm saying. We all have to fight. And that's the whole purpose of God inspiring the writer of Hebrews to list all of those people in chapter 11 is so that when I read that, Jeff Brantley can have his faith increased by someone else. So since I have such a great cloud of witnesses, now this is what it's got to encourage me to do. Faith, faith, faith is not it. Somebody say faith is not it. it. It's not faith alone, Right? Because that's what the great majority of Christianity, those who claim Christianity in our generation, pro proclaim. Faith, 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 just have faith, just have faith. Faith that doesn't lead to works is dead. We can talk about faith all day long, but if our talking about faith and encouraging one another to believe doesn't eventually lead to some changes, some actions... We take some actions, we make some changes in how we think, we make some changes in how we choose. Unless that happens, we've missed the whole point of faith. The point of faith is not just to believe in God. The point of faith is to believe in God to the degree that it changes your own life. Isn't that exactly what James is saying? Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. And then three times in the passage he says, faith without works is dead, being alone. Faith then empowers my work. So I, it starts with faith. I've got to start with faith. If I don't truly believe uh, concerning God, his word, his son, if I don't truly believe those things, then I, I have nothing to actually live righteous and in truth and earn salvation and have peace in my own life if we go back to the, the armor of God in Ephesians 6. So it starts with faith. But faith then should make some significant changes. Faith should produce holiness. That's what he's saying here in this verse. Your faith. Now that we've talked about faith, now that I've inspired you to faith, now your faith has got to get you to a place where you, let us, let you lay aside every encumbrance, everything that would slow you down, and the sin which so easily entangles us. You've got to lay that down and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the purpose of faith is to get you inspired and ultimately empowered to live above sin. Faith, a lot of people are not pushing faith. A lot of people are pushing hype. Emotional hype. Spiritual faith has been substituted in, in droves, in multitudes of churches. Spiritual faith has been substituted for emotional hype. Because you go to church, you get all hyped up, you hear the choir sing, you watch the drama team, you have all kinds of entertainment mentalities in churches. And everybody gets all hyped up. And then before they go to bed on Sunday night, they've sinned again over and over and over and over and over. And these cycles, because true spiritual faith causes you to lay aside anything that would entangle you. Sin, weights, lust. If you truly believed that you were one day going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, if you truly believed that, you would live this day without sinning against him and his word. If you truly believed that one day you're going to stand before the judgment seat, you would live holy. You would live righteous. But the reason you don't live holy and you don't live righteous is because you don't truly believe that. You say you do, you're like a parakeet, just repeating what you hear other people say. But in your own heart, 
You don't truly believe it. That's what I'm talking about. You can go to church, talk about Christ, and get emotionally hyped up, but you don't truly have faith in Christ and in his word. We've got to expose these differences. These things are leading people to hell. They are deceiving themselves because they are replacing emotional hype with true spiritual faith. Right? It is what it is. I could get into the whole ability of faith. People lack faith. They say they believe in Christ, but they really don't, to, if we're being honest. Um, that, that's why there's so many scriptures about uh, lip service, worshiping him with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Such statements were made to, to expose that exact mentality. Well, I talk about God, so I have faith in him. No, the devils talk about God. But there is no works. That, that's how you differentiate between somebody who's emotionally living for God and somebody who's spiritually living for God. So faith then, let me move on, I'll be here all day. So faith, it should, it must. If, if, if our faith sh falls short anywhere less than causing us to live above sin, Our faith is lacking. Right? That's the purpose of faith. Man. To every man has been given a measure of faith. God has given a measure of faith inside of every single one of us. What is the purpose of that faith? Right? Because God created humanity without going, I make this as concise as possible. Without going into a lot of detail, God created humanity because he wanted to have relationship with them. Because of man's sin, God had to separate himself. But even in that, God sent a way of reconciliation. And that was his son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. That whosoever would believe on him, and I'll get into all this in a minute, this reconciliation with God. But God gave us a way to be reconciled unto him. He put inside of us faith. Every one of us have faith. People say, well, I don't believe that. Listen, atheists have faith. Listen, to believe that what we have now exploded from outer space and created such perfect harmony in our world and in our universe, that takes faith to believe something like that. In fact, I've often wondered if they don't have more faith than what I have. You, listen, you believe a germ swimming around in the ocean turned into a fish, and a fish crawled up on land and turned into a monkey, and a monkey kept developing and turned into a man, but yet we still have germs, fish, and monkeys who did not evolve, you got to have faith to not believe in God. So even them have, even those people have a measure of faith. The thing is, they invested that faith in the wrong thing. To every man is giving a measure of faith. And so that measure of faith, the enemy is constantly coming after because he understands if I can get their faith, I can get everything else. I can get their truth, I can get their righteousness, I can get their peace, I can get their salvation. I can burn it all to the ground if they just let me have access to their faith long enough. To, if they let me constantly bombard their faith, I will eventually vex them and wear them down. Isn't that the plot of Satan as revealed in the book of Daniel? The plot was to wear out the saints. Like we talked about, you don't get pierced through with the arrows. You just get burnt down over time. Fiery darts. Fiery arrows. So understanding then that faith is given to empower us to more than just believe in God. Faith is given to us from God to make us become like God. Because even the demons have faith enough to believe in God. But their faith doesn't lead them to become 
like God, holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. And now many Christians are sitting in churches now being taught and believing, hook, line, and sinker. Again, they have faith. They're just investing it in lies, false doctrine. They believe you can't live above sin. When the whole New Testament, the whole purpose of the New Testament is to teach us that we can live above sin and that that should be our goal. That we should ever be pressing towards that level of perfection. We, we hear it all the time around here. I'm not going to hit those scriptures. Give me verse 2. So understanding faith then should empower me to begin laying down sin. If I truly believe in God and I believe that I'm going to stand before, in judgment before him one day, if I truly believe that, that then empowers me to begin living above sin. Right? And by his grace, not by, not by my own power, but by his Holy Spirit and, and me being sensitive to my conscience. He's constantly speaking to my conscience. And if I'll listen, every time he speaks to my conscience, every time his Holy Spirit will keep me from sinning. Every time. It's the moments of temptation that I don't listen to my conscience that I give in. So it is absolutely possible for a human being, if they are totally sold out to God, if their faith, is, if they truly have faith and not just emotional hype in God and in his promises, for them to live above sin. That's what the writer of Hebrews is teaching us here. Now here's a key to living above sin. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. And, and here's, here's the damage false doctrine has done for the past 2,000 years since Christ and the apostles have, have well, still Christ is alive, but since he was walking on the earth teaching us. They've told us that, well, Jesus lived above sin because he was God manifested in the flesh. And that step, once a person believes that false doctrine, which neither Jesus nor the apostles ever taught, they taught that Jesus was a man approved of God, that he was the Son of God. But he was tempted in all points just like I am. God cannot be tempted. That's the word. God cannot be tempted. Neither does he tempt any man. That's the scripture. But because people have been taught to believe that Jesus was a divine God in the flesh, they don't really believe he was truly tempted like we are. Therefore, when you don't believe that, then you start making up excuses and justifications. Well, the reason Jesus lived above sin is because he was God. I'm not God, so it's not possible for me to live above sin. The problem is the scriptures don't teach that Jesus was almighty God wrapped in flesh. The scriptures teach he was a man anointed by God, first one born with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, born of the Spirit. And he totally surrendered his own will to the leading of God's Holy Spirit in his life. That's how he lived above sin. Not because he was God, but because he was obedient to God. That's the word. And these damnable doctrines, these doctrines of devils have been released into the church to rob people of their faith. Because if you believe Jesus was God in the flesh, there's no way you believe you can live above sin. All the while, the scriptures are teaching us the opposite. About Christ and about ourselves. So you see the attack on our faith. I think a lot of people tend to believe the attack on their faith comes from the outside. Like, well, you know, I want to live in sin, I want to go to the club, I want, I want to ha commit fornication, lust, whatever the case may be. But the great, for the great majority, some of us are tempted in those ways, but for the great majority of us, our temptation comes in a very different form. Our temptation comes in the form of false doctrine. To believe the lies of the religious traditions of men. So if Satan can't get us in the club fornicating, 
he'll get us in the church by selling half truths. Either way, he has corrupted and perverted our faith. And he don't care if you lost sitting on a church pew or if you lost sitting on a bar stool. Lost is lost. In fact, you're more dangerous being lost sitting on a church pew because you think you're saved. At least the person sitting in the bar knows. I'm not faking. I know my life ain't right. That's why Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. Strong words. And all of this has to do with faith. Here, here's the key. If we're going to truly live in spiritual faith, not emotional hype about God in Christ, but true spiritual faith in God in Christ, here's, here's the key. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of what? of our faith everything Jesus did was to show us what to believe and, and to perfect what we believe over the course of time in what Jesus told us man there's so much in so many scriptures um, Jesus said I'll go away it's good for you if I go away I'll send unto you another talking about the Holy Spirit he shall lead you into all truth. Like Jesus said, I've just given you a, a, a little bit of truth here while I'm on this earth. But now I'm going to baptize you with the same Holy Ghost that I got baptized with. And just like the Father sent me, so am I going to send you, receive you, the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus, being the author, he showed us what true faith, true faith, not emotional hype. True faith, faithful even unto death. He believed it that much. He believed it to give up his life. Man, by giving us that picture of faith. Now, when we look back at the life of Jesus... When we read the Gospels, when we read what the apostles wrote in the epistles about Christ, when we read these things, these things are written for our perfection. That my faith be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So when I look to Jesus, the, the, the Holy Spirit that he has given me is going to remind me of the words of Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now, we talk about this all the time. Everybody wants to talk about the cross of Christ. Christ wants to talk about, talk about the cross of you. All my sins are nailed to the cross of Christ. No, your sins are nailed to your own cross. Christ died to show you how... First of all, that it can be done. You can live above sin. Secondly, to make a way that you be empowered with the same Holy Spirit he was empowered with, that you listen to and obey your conscience and intuition, just like he obeyed his conscience and intuition, and thereby has given you access to live above sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. The author and the finisher. Watch this. i got to move on. Ah. Who for the joy set before him, Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's so much here. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners. Here's the key. When you're tempted, you're going to have to quit looking at how bad you want to do this thing. And you're going to have to get your eyes on Jesus. I... I made fun of these things in the past but there's a little bit of truth to it to be honest I'm not going to wear a bracelet on my hand that says WWJD but I'm going to burn it in my mind and in my heart what would Jesus do he's facing the temptation I'm facing right now if I start thinking of it from my perspective and well, man it would be so pleasurable to give in to that temptation how long do you think I'm going to be able to keep myself from that temptation? It's 
some of us have willpower, and we may keep ourselves away, away from them for a while. But ultimately, every one of us, regardless of the time it takes, ultimately, every one of us are going to give in to that temptation. The only thing that's going to keep us from giving in to that temptation is considering Christ. How would he handle it? How did he do it? He was tempted in all points, even like I'm being tempted right now. He has dealt with every kind of temptation and overcame it all. All right, if you don't get anything out of this part, what I'm saying right here about looking to Christ, because I realize that can be spoken a lot of times, and it's, it's difficult and practical. But concerning Christ, so many people, when they approach the scriptures or when they approach God and they're seeking God, they're seeking God for deliverance and blessings. Right? Aren't we all guilty of that? Like, I'll go for a while and I haven't prayed, just, just distracted, just more concerned about the things of this life than it was about prayer. Right? Have we all done that? Yeah. And then I get in trouble. And I'm like, Oh, God, I need some help. I need you to deliver me. I need you to help me. I need you to bless me. I need you to keep me. And so when the, little, the few times I do approach God, it's because I want him to bless me. Here, here's, here's what it means to look towards Jesus. Look towards Jesus means take up your own cross daily. Deny yourself daily. And do your best to follow in the footsteps of Christ daily. That's what it means to look towards Christ. People think looking towards Christ is when you get in trouble, oh Jesus, help me. That's not looking towards Christ. You're deceiving yourself. Looking towards Christ is every day I am constantly thinking about, meditating on, praying about how I can become more like Jesus Christ. That's what it means to look to Jesus. But that's been watered down in our generation. Nobody's taught that they actually got to live like Jesus. They're just taught, call on Jesus so he can bless you. Does that make sense? Are we real enough to, to receive that? We should spend the great majority of our time seeking and praying and studying the scriptures, not for deliverance or answers or blessings. We should seek and study and pray for how I can be more like Jesus. It's that kind of mentality, that kind of faith in Christ that's going to bring deliverance in my life. Because God blessing you with a $500 check to get your rent paid is not going to lead to your salvation. So God gives us one blessing. We praise him. We thank, We shout. We dance. We talk in tongues. And then we go right back into our sins. Right? That's not true Christianity. We deceived ourselves if that is our idea of Christianity. And nobody in here would say, well, that's my idea of Christianity. Nobody's going to own up to that. But let's start taking inventory of how you've prayed this week. When you prayed, how much time did you spend praying, asking God to do something for you or deliver you or help you? In verses, how much time you spent, change me, transform me, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Creating me a broken and a contrite spirit. Those are the sacrifices that you desire. And unless we're somewhere in the range of a 90 to 10% ratio, we're not truly looking to Jesus. We're looking to ourselves, hoping that Jesus will have mercy on our mess. That's why Jesus said, seek first the, king, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things you're so worried about. Clothing, housing, food. These things will be added unto you because your heavenly father knows you have need of these things before you even ask. 
He's not wanting you to pray about blessings. He's wanting you to pray about change. Judging yourself against, not against all the, uh, oh, I hear, it drives me nuts when I hear people do this all the time. They, they uh, well, well, thank God I'm not what I used to be. I may not be what I'm supposed to be, but thank God I'm not what I'm used to be. Well, what, so you've moved two steps, but you're still in sin. What good have you done? So you're not robbing banks anymore, but you're still living in adultery. What good have you done? And they justify it. And a lot of people justify it in their minds because they look at the rest of the religious world and they see all the foolishness going on in all these churches all around and they're thinking in their minds, well, I'm not that bad, so I must be pretty good with God. And we're judging ourselves against a, a rotten, decaying standard. We've got to judge ourselves against Christ. Ephesians 4 tells us that. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time. If you're taking notes, write that down because you really need to look at this. This Ephesians 4, he has given us the fivefold ministry to perfect the saints. How perfect should they be? Until they come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Think about that statement. God has given us his word. He's given us ministers to constantly perfect us until we get to the same level Christ was. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we're judging ourselves against every other hypocrite in the church thinking we're okay because we're not that bad. We're not as bad as them. That's not looking to Jesus. That's looking to hypocrites. To look to Jesus means you measure yourself by the perfect standard of judgment. Looking unto Jesus who is the author and he is the finisher. He will perfect your faith to be just like his faith if you keep looking to him. Ah, there's so much here. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Think about how Jesus went through persecution and he'd done nothing wrong. So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I don't know, Pastor, my family makes it so hard for me to live for God. You ain't even come close to what Jesus went. A whole country made it hard for him to live for God. They trying to stone him every time he turned around. When's the last time you were, you, somebody tried to stone you? But Christ, on a completely different extreme level than we have ever or pro maybe will ever encounter. Consider him who endured that hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's what it means to look to Jesus. How did Jesus deal with persecution? How did Jesus deal with temptation? The whole world was coming against him because of his holiness. Did he cave in? No. And neither must I lose heart and cave in. Looking unto Jesus to model him, to imitate him in every way, shape, form, or fashion. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. You think it's hard living holy and righteous and ain't nobody trying to kill you for it. They were killing him for his holiness. Literally killed him for his holiness. He was so convicting to the religious hypocrites of his day that they ended up taking his life. We've not strived to that level yet. So if he can attain that level, my faith in him, taking up my own cross daily, denying myself daily, following in his footsteps daily, will get me to the same place he got. To stand before God blameless. Blameless and harmless, the Son of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But when Paul writes it, he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about you. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. He ain't even talking about Jesus. He's talking about you. It can be done. The issue is your faith.
verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Now watch this. We're entering into a different topic. Well, a subtopic. Not really a different topic, but a little bit deeper. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. Now, what, what's, the, what's the original topic we're talking about? Faith, which leads to sinlessness, to live above sin, just like Christ lived above sin. That's the topic. Now we're going a little bit deeper. My son, don't forget this. Don't forget that you have been warned. You are going to be rebuked by God. You are going to be chastised by God. When you follow in the footsteps of Christ, you are going to be chastised just like Christ was chastised. Why do you think Jesus on the cross said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? At that moment, he felt chastised by God. The Old Testament actually said he would be forsaken, stricken by God. Isaiah 53. God did this to him. God could have sent legions of angels and kept Christ from going through the horror of the cross and all that it entailed. But he did not. He allowed it to happen. He was stricken, smitten by God. Don't forget that. That's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us now. Don't you dare forget that God deals with his sons differently than a lot of people think God should deal with his people. A lot of people think God should, since he has the power to, should deliver his people, should bless his people, should make his people the head and not the tail. Israel believed that and they fell away from God because their faith was misplaced. They believed they should be the number one. And because of their disobedience, instead of God rewarding them, God was constantly chastising them, correcting them. Trying to perfect them. It's 11.30 and we, know we might be here about 3.30 today if I hit all of this. Jonah. Was he blessed by God or was he chastised by, by, by God? Now, now that we can see Jonah, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. It, when We weren't with Jonah in the belly of the whale, right? We weren't thinking the thoughts that were going through his mind at that point. We read the story, and we, we read it, we know the end from the beginning. Can you imagine what Jonah was going through, thinking in, in this, this time period? But, and, I, and then I asked you a question. Here, now, here's how God views things since we view things. We, I asked the question, and just about everybody in here said he was chastised, right? And he was chastised. But the truth is his chastisement was a blessing. The, the right God's answer to the question I just asked is both. He was blessed by chastisement. Think about that. Think about how deep that really is. I'm struggling over here, wondering if God's ever going to deliver me from this or deliver me from that. And all the while, the thing I hate, the thing I despise, the thing that if I don't control is ultimately going to cause me to lose my faith in God altogether, that very thing is actually God's way of blessing me. carnal mind can't receive that. It's foolishness to it. The natural mind can't receive things like that. It's completely foolish. Isn't that what Paul said? But that's how God thinks. That's how God deals with his people. Oh, you want to be my son? You think I'm going to give you a kingdom. I'm going to give you trouble. I'm going to give you persecution. I'm going to give you temptation. I'm going to give you a cross. 
You're my only begotten son, the Christ, sent that I'm going to give the entire world to you. But instead of the world, he gives him a cross. And then Jesus turns to us and makes statements like, in the world you shall have tribulation. Don't expect nothing out of this world but problems, troubles, struggles, and trials. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. And my peace I give to you. Not peace like the world gives. What's peace like the world gives? Peace like the world gives is I'm going to remove all your problems. Well, anybody can have peace. He ain't got no problems. Jesus gives a higher level of peace. Peace in the midst of problems. Peace that passes understanding. And we're serving a God who's constantly beating us. Chastising us. People have no, when they say I don't sign up for Christianity, they have no clue what they're getting into. They don't have a clue what they're getting into. They're thinking about what they're going to get out of it. They're thinking about it from a carnal-minded aspect. I'm going to rule and reign with Christ. You're going to be fought by devils every step of the way. You're going to be fought by people you love the most every step of the way. Even those of your own household are going to come against you. That's what Jesus promised. But we forgot that. So we struggle. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. Reprove simply means to prove again. Many of us go through situations in, 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 in our lives, and it's just God trying to prove us, test us. God may not tempt you, but he will absolutely test you. Ah. Verse 6. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. (laughs) Those whom the Lord loves, he blesses and he keeps. And he makes to rule and reign. (laughs) See, that's the foolishness that these prosperity preachers are teaching us. And it's causing so many people's faith to be misplaced. And ultimately dissolved under the attack of the enemy. Whom God loves, he disciplines. My dad beat me unmercifully sometimes. I felt like it was unmercifully. And, and would, then would turn around and say, I love you. And I'm like, repent. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. You need to repent. You just lied. There ain't nobody that loves nobody like you just loved me. <laughs> but now that I've grown up, And I look back, and I'm not running around looking like a spoiled little fool that thinks the whole world owes me something. Now I can see that love. And I can see that he was trying to keep me from some things that I thought were blessings that were actually curses. While he was giving me a curse at the moment that actually turned out to be a blessing. That's what, God, that's what the writer is telling us here. This is how God deals with his sons. You call yourself a son of God, you better be prepared. Don't forget this. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges. Scourges like they would make a whip and beat people with it. That's what a scourge is. And God scourges every son whom he... Oh, I, I, I came to God today. Good. Whack, whack, whack. The way you know God has received you is you get a scourge. 
Welcome to the family, son. <laughs> Here's your first test. Here's your first supper. You still want to be a Christian? Because if some of you decide this is not for me, that's exactly what I'm after. I'm trying to weed the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff. And Jesus didn't pull punch. Jesus did. Be, uh, if I get on that, I'll be here all day. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son who he, who he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. And that phrase right there is tremendously deep. I feel like this is one of those, we talked about diamonds before, and you turn them just a little bit, and you see a different color when you turn it. This is, this is one of those phrases. It is for discipline that you endure. So you mean if I endure this trial, the only reason I'm enduring is for more discipline. Listen, to live a life like this, you got to have a completely different mentality than most of us have. Because we don't want discipline. But the, the writer here, and this is just one facet of many concerning this phrase, it is for discipline that you endure. All right, I'm going to hit two facets. Which means when I endure discipline now, when I get through this discipline, when I endure this discipline, I'm going to enter into more discipline. But, but we see that as a curse, whereas God sees it as a blessing. Because with, like Jonah, I asked you a while ago, did he curse him or did he bless him? Did he chastise him or did he bless him? Both, when we see it from God's perspective, because when God disciplines me, he has perfected my faith to be a little bit more like Christ. He has prepared me to endure suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, making me ready to actually stand before the judgment instead of lying to myself saying I'm ready for it. He's actually getting me ready. Okay. Let me give you an example of this. Okay, my 13-year-old son here, he may be tall for his age, but let's, let's say, um, and I ain't watched boxing in a while, so I don't know anybody new names, but let's say, son, in six months, I'm going to put you in the ring with Mike Tyson in his prime. My son would be an absolute fool to lay on the couch and eat potato chips and watch TV for six months. An absolute fool. What I should do as a father, if that's got to happen, what I should do as a father is drag his butt out of bed at 6 o'clock every morning and put him on a treadmill, have him working a speed bag, have him doing some push-ups. And when he hates my guts and I let him go to sleep that night, I'm going to wake him up tomorrow and do it all over again. Punish him chastise him, correct him. Now let's use God's language. Perfect him. Prepare him. And we want to lay around all the time spiritually lazy, waiting for the judgment, and we don't have a clue what we're about to step into. And all the while, God knowing what's coming, is putting you through one discipline after another discipline after another discipline after another discipline. Why? To, just because he gets a kick out of making you suffer? No, because he's making you ready for the judgment. That's what the writer's teaching us here. It is for discipline that you endure. All right, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is once you have endured through some discipline and you begin to gain and understand why you're having to go through such things, that then gives you emp empowerment to actually start enduring more and embracing discipline. 
The apostles wrote such things like, I count it glory to suffer for the cause of Christ. What? I count it all joy to go through diverse temptations. You enjoy this? You like this? Nobody's flesh likes it, but these men had attained such a level of spiritual understanding, they knew that suffering for this present time is preparation for something greater. Why does a fighter kill himself, basically, for six months preparing for his fight? He knows that preparation is going to give him the ultimate victory. So he endures. That don't bless y'all like it blesses me. That's good stuff for me. That is the mind of God. That is the God we serve. That's why you're having to deal with all the things you're dealing with right now. Because that's how God thinks about you. The son of God. Here you go. Instead of a hug, you receive a whip. It's the truth. Verse 8. Let me hurry. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children. And you're not even a son of God. If you're not willing to be disciplined, you can't be a son of God. Is essentially what that verse is saying. God doesn't even receive you unless you're willing to endure these temptations, these situations, these persecutions, all of these come in the form of chastisement, discipline, and ultimately perfection. So if God doesn't bother troubling you, you're in bad shape. Serious stuff. Nine. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? Jesus said it this way, if your father knows how to give good, good gifts to his children, how much more your heavenly father? You know, you ask for an egg, your father didn't give you a snake instead. If your earthly father understood discipline to that degree, how much more do you think your heavenly father understands discipline to this degree? Perfecting you, preparing you for life, ultimately preparing you for judgment. But they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Listen, I'm not saying God is void of blessings. I, I absolutely believe with all my heart we are going to one day rule on this earth with, with God or, or with Christ. In, in rule and reign with Christ on this earth. But now is not the time to reign. Only those who are faithful and endure to the end are going to reign, rule and reign with Christ. Now is the time for discipline. Now is the time for testing. Now is the time for chastisement. Now is the time to get right, get ready. You can't have victory without preparation. Verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. And everybody said amen. But it's sorrowful. Yet, yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peace, peaceful fruit of righteousness. Ah, nobody enjoys this. But those who are spiritually mature, who've been through enough chastisement, understand that I'll deal with the chastisement. I'll deal with the test because I know afterward it's going to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And righteousness is my ticket, not, not just faith. Everybody's teaching faith is your ticket to rule and reign with Christ. Faith is your ticket to righteousness. Righteousness is your ticket to rule and reign with Christ. Don't skip a step. That's what the scriptures teach. Verse 12. Therefore, 
ah, this is so good too. Now he gets into those of you that are spiritual. Now you've got to start dealing with those who may not be quite, they, not, they may not understand this process yet. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Well, who's weak and who's feeble? People who are struggling with chastisement. People who don't understand how their heavenly father actually thinks. People that don't understand the process of he's preparing you for the judgment. They're weak. Weak-minded, because all they can think about is the pleasures of the flesh. Pleasures of this life, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, so on and so forth. So it is our job to strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths for your feet. That's a deep, that's a deep statement. Oh, man. There's so many scriptures that come to my feet that are that that speedily run to mischief. Uh, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. This is what he said. You got to teach younger Christians. You better find a path that leads you away from temptation, away from sin. But many people live according to Christ, and they make they make provision to fall into sin. Well, if I be around this person, I'm gonna end up in sin, and then they make provision. To hang out with that person. When that's the last thing you need to do. You need to completely cut that person off. Lock, stock, and barrel. And throw away the key. Make straight paths for your feet. If your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Make straight paths. Don't make crooked little paths to pit stop at every temptation. Make straight paths. Straight to God. Straight to righteousness. Teach people to think like this. That's the point of this passage. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. They're kind of out of whack right now, but if somebody don't do something to get them back in line, eventually they're going to be cut off completely. So you do whatever it takes to get the one leaning to the left back in place. Before he gets taken completely out of joint. So that he may be healed. She may be healed. And make straight. Uh, yeah, 14. Pursue peace with all men and sanctification. Without which, I don't care how much faith you got. If you ain't got no sanctification, you're not going to see God. If there's no holiness, there's no righteousness, you can believe till your belly button falls off. And you're still not going to make it. Because without holiness, nobody's going to see God. Not me, not anybody. Holiness is his standard. That's what he requires. Follow peace. Try to live at peace with all men. Now, he's just told you to when somebody gets out of line, you've got to put them back in line. When they're weak, you've got to encourage them. Listen, if my 13-year-old son who's not yet a man is not weak and I'm trying to make him weak to fight Mike Tyson in his prime, he's going to hate my guts. But yet at the same time, I've got to try to balance preparing him with having peace with him. Do me a favor right now and just tell somebody, thank God for your elders. I thank God for my elders. And now I want you to tell somebody else, thank God I am not an elder. <laughs> let, let me move on. Fifteen. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Now, everybody's talking about what grace is. God just puts on a blindfold and doesn't even look at my sins anymore. No, Paul told Titus, grace teaches you not to sin. That's God's grace. This grace where God puts on a blindfold is called licentiousness. 
That's what Jude said. They have turned the grace of God into licentiousness. For those who may not know what licentiousness is, it simply means a lack of self-restraint. They have turned the grace of God into a lack of self-restraint. They do whatever they want to do and they say, I'm covered by God's grace. Great God's grace empowers you not to sin. Not ignore sin. Truly delivers you from sin. Don't settle for the, for the half-step and false doctrine. That, 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 that stuff will make you lost. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Because when they get chastised, they're going to have a temptation at, at the very least. A temptation to get bitter with God. And they're probably going to get bitter with you if you're involved in the perfection process. Some heavy stuff, man. Some, some truly heavy stuff. We have a greater responsibility than we think we do. That, that's why I'm bringing this out today. 16. That therefore... That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. And he gives us Esau as an example. Who sold his birthright for a single meal. Now how does that equate to what he's writing here? We're trying to live holy, live righteous. And people want to sell their righteousness and sell their holiness. Which is their birthright into the kingdom of God. Not faith. Faith empowers your righteousness. Righteousness empowers you into the kingdom of God. That's what the scriptures teach in a whole, as a whole. Don't be like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal, just for a little bit of pleasure for a few moments. Sold his righteousness. Don't be like Esau. 17. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it, With tears. That's a heavy stuff. I've been here a long time already. 18. For you have not come to a mountain. And this isn't, this is, uh, these are subtopics. Like, first topic is live holy, live righteous, living above sin. Now he's getting into how God's going to get you to live above sin. He's going to chastise you. He's going to test you. Now, watch how how the writer begins to describe our relationship with God. And understanding this is, a, is another key to help you actually live above sin. For you have not come, and he describes what's going on with the Old Testament, the children of Israel, you'll see that in a moment. For you have not come to a mountain that cannot be, or can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness with gloom and the whirlwind. You remember the Old Testament? Um, uh, the people said, we want to talk to God. And, and, and then God showed up on Mount Horeb with thunder and lightning. And, and, and then people said, no, we don't want to talk to God. We're going to send Moses to talk to God. And then you just come back and tell us what God said. Right? They rejected relationship with God because they didn't like the way God was presenting himself. Now he's just told us in the previous verses how God presents himself. Oh, you want to be my son? Pow! I don't like that God. I don't like the way he's presenting himself. All this chastisement talk. Here, false prophet, you go talk to God for me. And you come back and tell me what he said. God said he wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. Just give me $500 a month. And people sell into that crap. Lock, stock, and barrel. Because they don't want to deal with the God who tries them. They want to deal with the false God that's being presented to them that blesses you. The blessing without, oh man, the victory without the preparation. Listen, and Israel rejected God because they didn't like the scary way God presented himself. But you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, a blazing fire, to darkness with gloom and a whirlwind. Watch this. Ah, and to the blast of a trumpet and to the sound of words which sound, which was 
such a, that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. That's what it boiled down to. They don't want to deal with the commandments. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion. Oh, man. There is no more thundering and lightning, and there's no more stoning animals involved. But there's tests, and there's trials, and there's chastisement, and there's preparation, and there's training, and there's perfection. You have not come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. You have come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Colossians tells us who the firstborn is. That's Jesus Christ, the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven and to God. So you've come to, God, to Christ and God, who is the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous. Remember he called God the father of spirits? Remember a couple of weeks ago, Elder Franco was teaching so beautifully on God deals with your spirit to win your soul, how the enemy deals with your flesh to win your soul. God is the father of spirits. He deals with you on a spiritual level. And no man can come unto God. He can't worship God except it be in spirit and truth. You can't come to God on an intellectual level. You've got to come to God on a spiritual level. He is the father of spirits. Now, this is his purpose. The father of spirits then is working to make the spirits of the righteous will be made. Well, I'm not dealing with thunder and lightning anymore, but I'm dealing with a God who is adamant on my perfection. His whole goal of interacting with me is to perfect me. How did the verses previous tell me he's going to perfect me? He's going to beat me. Discipline me, test me, prep me, work me. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. There's some deep thoughts in here. That's it, right? And then there's 13. I'm going to stop right here. Stand with me, if you will. We need, well, let's pray. Sincerely pray. Start a prayer that hopefully will be finished in the next few days. That we continue to pray these things. Father, I receive your word today with meekness. The engrafted word which is able to save my soul. God, give me your understanding, true divine understanding of who you are as my heavenly Father and that I may be mature enough to understand how you deal with your sons. It is your desire for me to be victorious. Therefore, you are preparing me through every test and trial and affliction that I face right now. You are preparing me for judgment. Because you want me to succeed. You want me to be victorious. You want me to overcome the adversary of my soul. Help us, Father, to understand this. To truly receive revelation in our spirits, in our intuition today concerning who you are and how you deal with your sons and with your daughters. We seek you today and we look to Jesus Christ. He is the perfect example of how you deal with your sons. That I may look unto Jesus, not just call on him in times of trouble. That I may do everything I can to pattern my life after him in every way. For it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives in me. And my life is not my own. I have been born with a price. Or will I glorify you, O oh God, my Father which is in heaven, in my body and in my spirit, which is yours, Father, the Father of spirits. 
I thank you for your wisdom, God. And I thank you for your love that has been manifested to me in the form of chastisement, in the form of preparation. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your spirit, Father, that's going to lead me through every test and every trial. I thank you for the spirit that's going to lead me into all truth. And I embrace it, Father. In the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, do I pray this for myself and for my brothers and sisters today, that we have true understanding of what you desire for us, oh God. How many of you understand that God loves you? How many of you truly understand that God loves you? I thank God for for loving us. Amen. True love. So many times you you see on the news or or something like that a a terrible story concerning a child where something tragic happens to them. And the reason why it happened to them is simply the neglect of the parents. The parents simply neglecting to correct them neglecting to pay attention to them, but we understand that God visits us. God pays attention to us. We're on his mind. He corrects us. And, and you know the, the, the parent that corrects the child does it because they love their child. They don't want their child to be hurt. They want their child to learn. They want their child not to make certain mistakes. So in order to keep them from making these mistakes, sometimes they're a little harder on them in order to correct them. But it's all for the purpose of teaching them. And God does that with us. He corrects us because he loves us, saints. Receive the correction. I thank God for the word. Go ahead and receive it when God chastens you, chastises you. Allow him to do those things. Receive those things with meekness. Amen? We receive them with meekness, and it's able to save our soul. He knows what he's doing, saints. He's a father. He's a father. We've entered into that relationship with God, beloved. Now are we the sons of God? We're not outcasts anymore. We're not orphans anymore. We're not apart from God. We've been united with God, and he wants to father us. Amen? I thank God for the word that came forth today. So many times people have a false concept of what Christianity is, and when stuff starts happening that's different than how they were told it was going to be, they wind up flaking and and falling away. And it's because of the false doctrine they heard. They have a a, a false picture painted of what it's like to serve God. I'm going to tell you what this morning, saints, if you walk out of here with a false picture of what it means to serve God, it's because you weren't paying attention. In in this world, you will have tribulation. Amen? Nobody lied to you and told you otherwise, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You will face things, but if you receive the chastening of the Lord, Receive his instruction. You will overcome everything that's coming against you. It it might not always be easy to your flesh, but you'll always have peace in the spirit if you walk with God. Amen. So let's let's receive the word that we heard this morning. Let's be faithful to it for truly it's Christianity. Amen. Tell your neighbor this is Christianity. We don't always want to hear it. God will bless you through it. it. It just ain't always how your flesh wants to be blessed. Amen. God's always blessing. Sometimes it's just not visible to the natural eye. Well, can I get a witness? I thank God for being consistently good to us. It's one thing God is. He's good. Amen. He's holy and he's going to be those all the time. Amen. Um, We're going to have brethren in the back to receive tithes and offerings this morning. Let's give according to the will of God. I don't believe there are any special announcements, but when we leave today, let's leave rejoicing enjoying in the fact that God's correcting us because he loves us. Amen. God's teaching us. God's instructing us. God's leading us. Let's be joyful this morning. Let's leave with the peace of God and the joy of God in our spirits this morning because he truly loves us. And you're dismissed in Jesus.